In the dark shadows and in the white cold, fearlessly we search for knowledge new and old. We drink the strong spirits and read the ancient tombs. The order of the Abracast, we are the brave and bold. <clears throat> the apocalypse, that sublime, cabalistic, and prophetic summary of all occult figures, divides its images into three septenaries. After each of which, there is silence in heaven. Then there are seven seals to be opened, that is to say, seven mysteries to know and seven difficulties to overcome, seven trumpets to sound and seven cups to empty. The apocalypse is, to those who receive the 19th degree, the apotheosis of that sublime faith which aspires to God alone and despises is all the pomp and works of Lucifer. <clears throat> Lucifer, the light bearer, strange and mysterious name given to the spirit of darkness. Lucifer, the son of the morning, is it he who bears the light? And with its splendors, intolerable, blinds, feeble, sensual, and selfish souls. Doubt it not, for traditions are full of divine revelations and inspirations. And inspiration is not one age, nor of one creed. <clears throat> Plato and Philo were inspired. This cold open is we're um it's the from Morals and Dogma um by uh Masonic head honcho <laughs> Albert Pike. It's from Morals and Dogma, it's from the Council of Kadosh section of the book, um, and it's chapter nineteen. It, each chapter corresponds with the degree that it's lecturing on. So this is the degree of the Grand Pontiff, which we are gonna get knuckle deep into tonight. So let's Yeah Yeah Let's move it. Move the move that ass. The Abercast. Oh, Occult, hey, baby. history, conspiracy, and violence. Hey, welcome everybody. Greetings and welcome to the American Sermon. Thank you for tuning in. This is going to be, I believe this is going to be the last of, I've been calling them our zero episodes. This is going to be like the last primer before we actually start this limited series off. So look, this is all just gravy. Like this isn't even what the, this isn't even, the podcast hasn't even started yet. <laughs> <laughs> um all right so let me get back on track welcome to the american sermon uh this is a limited series spinoff of my podcast called the abercast i am john towers i will be your worshipful master i will be your grand pontiff for the evening uh our stories are all about occult history conspiracy and violence if you dig these topics uh and topics like the one we're gonna be cut the topics we're going to be covering this evening, I would definitely recommend the Abercast to you. And it could be certainly, it could be found anywhere the greatest podcast can be found. We're literally everywhere. <laughs> so, um, yes, so welcome aboard. Uh, the American Sermon is all about the occult, the weird, and sometimes sinister stuff that is mixed in with the foundation of uh, our great country, the United States of America. So I hope that you enjoy this. And the way that the, the way the show 
starts as we we start heavy into the into some aspects of Freemasonry, but we don't come at it from the point of Freemasonry so much as we come f- from it as a point of mi- this myth, these two myths and legends um, of the origin, I guess, of Freemasonry. So I thought that for the prime, for the last primer, we really needed to do something that I think is super important when you're looking at all this stuff. <clears throat> so we're going to get into this and it's not, <laughs> I've never done so many disclaimers in my life as I've done prepping this, <laughs> this, this uh, podcast. So uh, trigger warnings or disclaimers or whatever kids are calling them nowadays. So we're not getting into this thing from a pro Mason point of view or an anti Mason point of view. We are waiting into all of this discussion, <clears throat> just thinking and keeping in mind that a lot of our founding fathers, a lot of the framers were Freemasons. And we also are keeping our eye on all the weird stuff that goes on along with that. Right. And along with the, the pro Freemason anti Freemason thing, like nowadays it's super popular. Like you can buy a book that will tell you, I mean, any, like, you know, it's anything we'll get into, I think we're going to get into some of this stuff. Like, you know, Freemasons act or rule the world. You know, it's a joke on the Simpsons, or at least it was, you know, 20 years ago or something, whatever that was. Um, so, you know, to avoid all the trappings of this, you know, <laughs> you know, Freemasons are, um, uh, stifling, they're somehow working to, uh, crash the electric car industry, you know, (laughs) or they're like hiding aliens in area 51 or something like to skip all of that stuff. And just like a, you know, full disclosure sort of situation. We, I'm going back in time. We're looking at their own books, um, for all three of the this this last zero episode and what is going to be episodes one and two of the American Sermon are all books from many, many years ago. And they are none of them have to do with <laughs> none of them have to do with space aliens and, and all this stuff. If that's the podcast you're looking for, I think you're in the wrong spot. So <clears throat> um I think it's going to be really important as we sort of officially start our journey into uh, this age of modern history channel TV shows and Disney movies like Na- the National Treasure movies, uh, as well as especially if you listen to other conspiracy podcasts and, uh, you know, we're all aware of Freemasonry on some level. And to me, it's like that Buddhist story about the three blind guys <laughs> who are in a room with an elephant <laughs> and each of them kind of has an elephant part in their hands. Uh, that sounds dirty. Each of them is touching a different part of the elephant. That probably sounds dirty too. I don't know. <clears throat> um, but, uh, you know, and they're all trying, they're like, Hey, the, the elephant's a wall <laughs> or the elephant's a snake or the elephant's a rope or whatever. <clears throat> Sometimes the meaning of that story is about perspective and seeing the bigger picture. But sometimes in that story, the blind guys all accuse each other of lying and start fighting each other. So the meaning of the story becomes about an absolutism or an absolute worldview where people like these blind dudes who hold on to their one part of the elephant and claim that it is the truth based on their subjective experience. And then claiming that all other information is false when if they weren't blind or, (laughs) well, that's probably insensitive. If they uh, probably a better way to insensitive, (laughs) A better way for me to say it is if they were able to have an open mind to what their fellow fellow blind dudes were talking about, they could understand the truth of the elephant. 
So besides the obvious metaphor to be made here regarding, oh, I don't know, our media, our education system, social media, our current society as a whole, you might be like, yo, motherfucker, what does this have to do with Freemasons, bro? And I guess that answer is, I think by design, Freemasons are a bunch of different things to a bunch of different people. Now, I've known a lot of Freemasons. I'm not a Freemason. I, I've known a lot of Freemasons. Uh, some of my drinking buddies are Freemasons, and I've hung out with uh, black Freemasons in the Pacific Northwest, uh, I, I think, at least as far as I know. You know, Freemasonry, are, are they're black dudes. <clears throat> they're They're the brothers, you know. Around here, they just happen to be the white guys. I don't know. Not that that makes any difference. I'm just saying, like, I know a lot of Freemasons. Um, to some Freemasons, they're just a fraternal order who raises money for charity. And they can uh, go out and catch a beer after the lodge. And to some other Freemasons, it's like a rite of passage into manhood or maturity that is lacking in our culture these days. So I've done a bunch of episodes on the Abercast regarding ceremonial magic and the Goetia and all this and so forth. And I've speculated on the importance of <clears throat> this uh, creative play that is missing in our modern lives. And I think these Masonic initiations and dramas and rituals and all this stuff uh, for their different degrees and all this fulfill that fulfill that component of creative play you know you don't have to worry about the mortgage for you know <laughs> you don't have to worry about the mortgage for the day because you're going to go and play hermes and you're going to go talk to this fucking philosopher and teach him about how to get to heaven you know what i mean like it you know with all the pomp and circumstance of these little mini plays and stuff that these guys do uh, and I also think that there could be a psychological benefit into stepping outside of your normal life and putting all this regalia on and aprons and so forth and, you know, doing these plays. <clears throat> Just like, you know, as I mentioned in the Goetia and the, the ceremonial magic episodes that I've done, um, I think that there is a psychological benefit on putting on black robes and drawing circles on the floor and lighting candles and ye yelling and babbling about Rahu or Kuwait. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting out your, uh, getting out your lesser key of Solomon and your, uh, uh, your demon catalog, and and start hollering and howling about, you know, Beelzebub, Beelzebub or Asmodeus and all this other kind of stuff. <clears throat> uh, where was I? <laughs> uh, to, okay, so to some other Freemasons, it's kind of like a self-help class. It's teaching you how to be a better person or to be trustworthy and to be accountable. And I think for a few of them, for just a few of them, they see it as a repository of the Western mystery traditions. Um, I think in my experience, very few of them are into this esoteric mindset. But we may get into more of that later. Like when I talk to my Freemason buddies, you know, if we're having a few drinks and I'm like, hey, you know, have you ever read uh, Rudolf Steiner's legend, uh, legend of the temple, you know, which we're going to get into next episode. And I start talking, talking about it and they look at me like I'm a lunatic, but this thing was written like a hundred fucking years ago or something. And they're like, that's just some, you know, you got that from ancient aliens or something. <laughs> uh, hold on. I got to lube up here for a second. So what is Freemasonry? Well, like I said, I think it's a lot of things to a lot of different people, but and it's very hard to define, actually. <laughs> but I got a couple things here. I'm going to get through them just real quick. Um, the di Dictionary of Freemasonry by Robert McCoy. <clears throat> he breaks it down in here. Mm, 89, I think. Okay. Well, it was just published in 89, but this is old. You can tell by all the typesetting and stuff. Freemasonry. The definition of Freemasonry has been numerous, and they all unite in declaring it to be a system of morality, 
and by practice of which its members may advance their spiritual interests and mount uh, by the theological ladder from the lodge on earth to the lodge in heaven. So they have a a bunch of like mini definitions here from like famous masonry. Like Washington says, the grand object of masonry is to promote the happiness of the human race. That sounds pretty good. <clears throat> Lord Dunham here says, I have ever felt it my duty to support and encourage the principles of Freemasonry because it powerfully develops all social and benevolent um, uh, affections. And benevolence is something we're going to get into tonight, actually, a little bit. <clears throat> and then Mackie, we, uh, he, the reason I blocked him out is because this is actually perfect for the episode tonight. And also, he's a guy who we're going to be talking about in the next couple in at least one of the next couple episodes, but I think two, he's, uh, uh, well, I'll just introduce him in the next two episodes, whatever, whatever it is. But he says Freemasonry is a science of symbols for which by their proper study, a search is instituted after truth, that truth consisting in the knowledge of the divine and human nature of God in the human soul. So these three that I talked about here in the definition section, these three people, well, maybe not Washington, um, but Dunham here and Mackie, I think they're talking about stuff that we are actually going to see in tonight's episode. They're, you know, talking about this, uh, uh, structure of symbolism, <clears throat> And uh, the last one I'm going to read is from, this is like my go-to book, uh, The Encyclopedia of Occultism by Lewis Spence. It's a compendium of information on the occult sciences, occult personalities, psychic science, magic, demonology, spiritism, mysticism, and metaphysics. And they have a lengthy entry like it's probably the largest entry in this whole book on uh, Freemasonry, but we're just going to do the beginning here. <clears throat> Freemasonry history and or origin as it says, uh, though, <laughs> though it would not be exactly correct to say that the history of Freemasonry was lost in the midst of antiquity. Uh, it is a competent, to God, I gotta get my fucking reading glasses on, bros. I'm getting old. God damn. Uh, it is competent to remark that although to a certain degree traceable, its records are of scanty nature and so crossed by the trails of other mystical brotherhoods that uh, disentanglement <laughs> is an extremely difficult process. The ancient legend of its foundation at the time of the building of the Temple of Jerusalem is manifestly traditional. Uh, it's one... Uh, it, if one might hazard an opinion, it would seem that at the very early epoch of the history of civilization, a cast of builders in stone arose whose jealousy guarded the secrets of their craft. In all probability, this, ca this cast was prehistoric. And not, uh, it is not unreasonable to assume uh, this when we process or sorry possess plenty of proof that an ancient caste of bronze workers flourished in every country in Europe and in Asia. Um, sometimes these bronze workers and these Masonic myths, and this is something we're going to talk about in the next episode or two, were called Dionysian artificers, which is a pretty heavy metal fucking like title to have and so this episode or even this series is not really about masonry per se <clears throat> like there is literally no way i can explain what freemasonry is <laughs> um but we are going to talk about a little bit is how masons okay uh God, this is going to be difficult. How some Masons deal with symbolism specifically in their stories. 
and we are going to look back at some of their actual own texts and literature. So the blind dude holding the tusk of Freemasonry is crying out, it's a spear. And the blind guy touching the side of Freemasonry is declaring, it's a wall. And the blind brother, you know, who is uh, stroking the trunk of Freemasonry is yelling, Freemasonry is a snake. So all of those blind guys are right. And there is no need to fist fight about it. If Masons are devil worshippers or Masons are guarding the secrets of UFO crash landings on Earth or if Masons secretly assassinated John F. Kennedy or if Masons are secretly running the world or if Masons are working behind the scenes to destroy the electric car, like, it's just cool. We can still believe all of those things. What we're looking at is how they deal with the symbolism that's in their own stories. So, (laughs) I guess that's the end of the trigger warning. All right. Uh, The featured books for this... (laughs) We're actually getting started. (laughs) The featured books for this evening are Morals and Dogma by Albert Pike, um, published in 1871. We're going to talk a little bit about um, Duncan's Masonic Ritual and Monitor by Malcolm Duncan, 1866. Uh, So we're going to be talking all about uh, the ritual of the 19th degree, which is called the Grand Pontiff. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Uh, We're going to get through a big, huge chunk of it, but... um, it's not the whole, don't worry, you're not going to have to listen to me read the whole, this whole fucking thing. Uh, if you recall from the cold open, this degree is linked to the book of Revelations, which is also linked to, I, <laughs> I don't know how out how deep in the weeds I should go, but it's also linked to the major arcana of the tarot card on a lot of different levels. Um, in the cold open, he talked about the septenaries and... Um, uh, which is a group of seven and the three septenaries are how we divide up the major, um, the major arcana of the tarot cards. Uh, uh, Pappas does it <laughs> one way, but we actually do it a we actually do it a different way um, in the in the podcast. So, it, uh, this groupings of sevens they're going to keep reoccurring over and over again. This is um, it, why uh, it's also linked to you know the seven. Well, it's linked to the seven trumpets, the seven seals, the seven cups, the you know seven tr- tribulations or whatever, and all of this. These septenaries. Um, uh, we have a we have a series that we're working on 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 the Abercast podcast where we're dealing with the tarot cards, um, and coming up they're already recorded. We're just waiting for them to 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 pump pop up there. We get in all deep into these into these cards and the ones that are. Um, posted already <clears throat> have all of the it i mean it has a lot of it has a ton of great information it talks about like the mechanics of the cards and stuff and then the ones that are going out now are the you know we're talking about the actual the actual cards and it's stuff that it's you know it's not in the 21 faces of god stuff like i'm going back and using old the old books to do it Anyhow, if you're interested in all that stuff, please check out the Abercast. You there's a feature topic link on abercast.com where you can go and all of the like a lot of our topics are grouped together. So you don't have to go searching through the whole list like they're all like right there. Um and there's a tarot card section. So if you want to get into that, like that's a great place to to go. <clears throat> I'm wildly off topic. However, Pike was not done. He also links this 19th, the 19th degree to the Kabbalah. And this is a very in-depth thing also. I can't really hope to summarize it in any cohesive way in this episode. Uh, but again, there's a, we're, we're smack dab in the middle of a Kabbalah series on the Abercast 2. And if you go to the feature topic link on Abercast.com, you can see what's is out and I think what's coming soon is also up there. So you can keep tabs on it. So 
let's get into this ta- enough <laughs> enough of this evangelical business for the Abercast. Let's get into uh, let's talk about this nineteenth degree. The grand, the grand, (laughs) the grand pontiff. Brethren, the officers of the consistory are about to confer with the full service, the degree of the grand pontiff. This is the third of the philosophical grades, the first and second having been confirmed in the Rose Croix chapter. And uh, it, this is the first degree coming under the jurisdiction of the Kadush of consistor- consistatory. It is devoted to the search for pure, primitive, and ethical truth. It is an ecclesiastical allegory and represents the consecration and ordination of a a pontiff or priest uh, in the order of Melchizedek. That should raise a red flag for everybody. The purpose and teaching is uh, to war against the seven prominent evils that pervade the world and through divine aid to overcome these evils by purity and thought to word and deed. So I say that this Melchizedek thing should raise a flag to everybody. This order of Melchizedek business is very important, and I think we I think we get into it in um, the next in the first real the first episode of the podcast. <clears throat> um, there is uh, certainly Abercast episodes about it. Um, it is this whole idea. So, okay, Melchizedek is this priest king. This uh, character is interpreted as a human merging of priestly and kingly lines. It, this is a merging of the line of Cain with the line of Seth. It's a merging that echoes through the Bible and also through specifically these Masonic legends we're going to be talking about. This dude, Melchizedek, um, in Solomon's temple is an attempt to merge these lines. And then ultimately Jesus is attempting to merge these lines. His mother was from the house of David. Um, (laughs) I'm sorry. My brain just fucking went into full nine, like fourth gear. Uh, the mergings of the sun and fire and the sons of water and all of this. Ultimately, this is why Pike identifies this great, this degree. Remember to the cold open with apotheosis, which is, uh, it's the deification of the Mason who's going through this, you know, uh, he's becoming God. It, this always reminds me of that. Um, the painting that's on the, in the Capitol on the roof or the ceiling of the Capitol building, the apotheosis of George Washington. It's like George Washington as Zeus. Like it's, it's bananas. If you look at it, you're like, that's George Washington. <laughs> Anyhow, that's what this is all about. It's the this merging of these two lines becoming a deity, becoming godlike. Uh, and Pike clearly identifies it as such in the chapter of Morals and Dogma, the, the part that we read for the Code Open. But I got to move on. Okay, so get back to it. <laughs> A dozen evil agents or spirits are in just intolerance, ignorance, superstition, indolence, ingratitude, and intemperance, subject to and under the control of the spirit of darkness. The seven good agents or uh, spirits are faith, hope, charity, justice. Uh, toleration, intelligence, and truth subject to and under the control of the spirit of light or the spirit of masonry. And we get to hear from the spirit of masonry later. Um, The drama uh, which you will witness is continuous, although divided into three sections and portrays the combat between these two forces, good and evil. The second or the second or middle section is a vision 
I should have cut that out. Uh, we're not talking about all three sections. We're talking about two of them, and we're cutting a bunch of stuff out. So they open up this chapter or the lodge or whatever, and it goes on. Uh, Lord, our God, thou art eternal and self-existent. Dost, thou dost read our thoughts before they are known to ourselves, and thou rulest the movements of the universe, and all events and revolutions are the creature of thy will. Thou art the infinite mind and supreme intelligence. Amen. God is the author of everything that exists, from whom nothing in the universe is hidden. Make of him no idols, but rather worship him in the deep solitude of the forest. Amen. God had this thought, I create worlds and lo, the universe and the law of harmony are the fruits of that thought light and air and the mysterious currents are under his domain amen in the beginning man had the word and that word was from god and that word communicated to man came the light of his existence amen this is all uh this is all kabbalah by the way God had his thought. I will. This is God's original thought. This is Kabbalah too. I will create man, a child of mercy, whose soul shall be my image and he shall possess ethical truth and he shall rule. And God did so before the world grew old and primitive truth had faded away and man had wandered amid the mazes of error, struggling in sloughs of materialism and beating his wings vainly in the vacuum of abstractions. Let us, faithful brethren, endeavor to return to the primitive truth. And to that end, I now declare this chapter of the pontiffs open <clears throat> so this knight of the rose croy shows up and he's a humble searcher and the ranks of truth uh shows up and this guy's name is uh philetus the philosopher and philetus comes in and approaches the altar to kneel down to it and they tell him hold philetus arise here none bends the knee save to uh to pour our uh pour out the soul in thanksgiving praise or supplication to the grand omnipotent above if such is your desire proceed faithful brethren face the east and philetus prays he, he does bend the knee and he prays and he says almighty oh, and inscrutable being i bow before thee as a primitive creator and the absolute and sole original existence aid me to keep and observe all the duties and responsibilities i am about to assume that i may strengthen my glorious inheritance in uh, the world to come confirm and sustain me and my good resolutions and keep me steadfast at the post of duty and to the eternal and merciful God be all praised forever. Amen. And these guys start chanting and then the, the grand pontiff that's overseeing all this says, our father, which art in heaven, look now to the, <laughs> I want to say supplicant <laughs> because of the McKetrick supplicant supplicants and ghostbusters but now look now upon this suppliant and about to become thy servant strengthen his resolution and suffer not temptation to overcome him teach him to exercise whatever powers he hath for the benefit of mankind which will tend to thy glory and let his earthly pilgrimages and per uh, preparatory to his final initiation into the mysteries of that sacred assembly over which thou rulest. Amen. 
It is explained to him, my brother, we are still engaged in the search for light and truth. But if you expect to find it in any particular creed or religion, your search will be in vain. This should start raising red flags for you guys. I'm going to reread it one more time just so you see what I'm saying. <clears throat> It is explained, my brother, we are still engaged in the search of light and truth. But if you expect uh, to find it in any particular creed or religion, your search will be in vain. For what truth is, uh, for what truth in one man is not truth in another. This is heresy. We're going to get into it. It is a great primitive truth revealed to man in the beginning that we desire to find. Let us then devote all of our energies to remove the mutilated and perverted philosophies that obstruct the passage to the great arcane light and truth. The mutilated and preserved philosophies they're talking about are organized religion. Like I said, it's a heresy. It's hidden. They're hiding their message, but they're talking about heresy. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. Oh, Christ. This is going to be a long episode, bro. I'm sorry. In all, back to the book, (laughs) in all ages, rosy gleams of light tinging the dark clouds of error have taught mankind that truth and light perfect and glorious linger below the horizon of mortal vision in time to rise like the sun and fill light perfect and glorious linger below the horizon of mortal vision in time to rise like the sun and fill God's universe with light and glory at the dawn of the promised day. Fortunate the Mason who with firm faith and hope accepts these rays as ample evidence that God's good time, his dawn of truth will come and be eternal. This is actually talking about, this is actually talking about the Kabbalah, how this light stretches out from God through the Sephirothic filters, each picking up its own color and meaning to it. Like I said, it's wait. I can't, uh, I can't do it again. Be patient, therefore, and wait, be not weary of well doing, be not weary of well doing, be not discouraged at man's apathy, nor disgusted with his follies, and care not for returns or results, but see only that there is to do, and do it, leaving the result to God. Phil- <coughs> Philtis goes on uh, to get examined, uh, and they ask him if he respects all religions, and he does, and uh uh, he tolerates all religions and he says he does. And, and then they ask him, are you willing to meet as brothers, all who believe in one God and in immortality of the soul, whether they have received their teachings from Confucius, Moses, Zoroaster, Mohammed, or the founder of the Christian religion? And, uh, he says he is. Tis well the great enigma of all ages to the human mind has been in the existence of evil. The antagonism of the good and of the evil principle has always existed, and it is our battle against the spirit of evil. Light and not darkness is eternal. Truth and not error is immortal. And he is sent back to the great pontiff after his examination. And he asked, 
before you can participate with us, my brother, in this work of lifetime. It will be necessary for you to travel four periods in search of the primitive truth. Uh, And in order to prepare yourself for the great work in which you will be engaged. Excellent junior deacon, invest our brother with a sword of undying faith in the mantle of charity and the staff of hope and immortality. So he gets sent on this side journey. He gets sent on this quest, right? And he's got he's got this new, you know, in all these mythical and mythical stories, one part of the hero's journey is you get these uh you get these magic weapons. <laughs> you know, Luke Skywalker gets his fucking lightsaber. Harry Potter, I don't know what he gets. A fucking stick. I don't know. <laughs> uh Perseus, you know, gets his helmet. Uh <laughs> a mechanical owl. <laughs> Paul Muad'Dib gets his uh, still suit. Arthur gets his gets his sword. Ash gets his chainsaw. I mean, I don't know. Like it just it goes on and on forever. So Philetus goes on his journey, and he he talks to this uh, Hermes, um, who's a <laughs> Hermes, who is a Greek god or the uh, Egyptian god Toth, um. There's a lot of episodes out there floating around about the Emerald Tablets of Tooth. Um, Anyhow, he runs into this Hermes character who starts talking to him. And he says, truth is not on Earth. Truth is beyond the comprehension of mortality. Prepare thyself for it is a revelation and reception by increasing thy love and veneration of the Supreme Father. Possess thyself not with slavish fear. For the eternal, omnipotent deity, but pure love and reverence for the infinity, the wise, good, and true. Thus, uh, you will be prepared for truth in the the great hereafter. So if Hermes is talking about this, the great father, the great deity that he's talking about is Zeus, right? Um... Then he goes and he meets Manu, the Hindu, and this Hindu instructs him, practice charity, uh, relieve misery and distress and console the brokenhearted and forgive the errors and judge kindly of the motives of others and thus be prepared for the truth of the great hereafter. Then he meets Philo, the Jew. That's, I mean, don't fucking freak out. That's the guy's name. That's the f- fucking dude's name. Who t- <laughs> who tells him, prepare thy soul on earth for its reception in that celestial abode where truth and light, the emanations of deity forever reign. So this guy, Philo the Jew, is talking about emanations. That is... This is one of those red flags that you guys should have. He's they're talking about the Kabbalah. Any kind of any time you see light and emanations, it's a metaphor for the power of God filtering through these Sephirothic filters to get down to um, the your world that you're operating on right now. And then back to the, I'm sorry for keep breaking this. I, I, I apologize. I hope it's not too terrible. John, the evangelist shows up and he says, I am John. The, I imagine his voice would actually be a little bit. <laughs> I imagine he'd be like, Hey, I'm John, the evangelist. <laughs> I'm John, the Christian evangelist, the Muslim and the Jew and the pagan and the Christian all have sought for truth on earth. And it was not there. The God and truth and is separality and the new life and the great hereafter. Man will no longer be isolated by metaphysics, philosophies, or creeds. <laughs> but, but will be a part of the eternal harmony surrounding him. In God... In God's eternity, all grow, move, and live in him, surrounded by infinite truth, infinite bounds, and infinite goodness. <clears throat> I don't know why I don't know why I turned him into that. Like he should have been a valley girl. That's what I should have did. I'm doing all this on the fly. Like I got rainy material, but come on. 
Philetus comes to the realization after talking to all these dudes that although the glorious and inestimable would be the result, yet vain must be the effort. If my labors in search of truth on earth are to be fruitless, why need I care of creed or dogma? Red flag. I do wrong to none and let the world move on its way in each care for himself. Then the cross, <laughs> then the, <laughs> then the cross appears three times to our young philosopher. And he asks, he asks the cross. So when I say the cross appears to him, what they're describing is there's like this gauze curtain and they shine a light that makes a shadow on the curtain. So the, um, the mason playing this uh, uh, philetus can see it. And he asks, <clears throat> the cross appears three times and our young philosopher, he asks, you, will you speak to me and tell me the truth and immortality? And each time the cross disappears on him without answering him. So eventually he winds up talking to the great pontiff again. And the great pontiff asked philetus, philetus, the influence of the words and the deeds of these who have lived through dread control our destiny. Thus unconsciously we obey the dead and the living. This is so important. <laughs> uh, we, when we are dead, we will obey us, whether, uh, whether for weal or we. Uh, the desire to do something that shall benefit the world is the noblest ambition attained to man. To this end, we have been instructed in the words of wisdom imparted by eminent shades of the past. Have you pondered upon them? And do you believe in them? If so, what is your desire? And he answers, great pontiff, for a moment I wavered in my duty, not from the want of faith, but from an unaccountable lassitude and dourness that I have overcome my good resolves. Even now the evil influence is resisted by only the exercise of a powerful will. Thelema. It, uh, that evidently emanates from the holy light that shone upon uh, me from above. This is Kabbalah. Uh, filling me with inspiration to persevere uh, and search in the ranks of truth. And the great pontiff says, Hear ye voice of the Lord. He shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trump of God. Here they, these masons are linking this directly to revelations, the, the trumpets, right? And also the judgment card of the tarot. And he says, uh, the last day of the Lord cometh as a thief in the night. And when you say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon you and you you shall not escape. And it says again, you brothers are not in darkness. That day should overtake you as a thief. And the grand pontiff says, uh, we are the sons of light in the children of the day. And we shall, and we are not of the night or the darkness. Remember this next. Remember this. When you listen to episode one, we are the sons of light. He says, Okay, so all the this archangel and God start yelling again. <laughs> they start yelling again. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober and see that none renders evil for unto and unto any man, but follows that which is good unto every man. And this pretty much ends the first part here. And we're going to look at this thing and it doesn't sound too bad, right? I mean, <laughs> uh, we're looking at it in the context of today's, you know, secularism, uh, seat the discussion, but however, seat the discussion, to any serious minded Christian teaching and red flags start going up everywhere. So if you're wondering, like, 
where the people get the idea that Masons are Luciferians or Satanists or whatever. Well, first of all, Albert Pike didn't do him any favors by <laughs> by all this Lucifer business and morals and dogma, especially specifically in this chapter. Um, but uh, you have to look at the context of what what this chapter is talking about. And I, this is not about all the other chapters. This is not about all the other degrees. I specifically chose this one because it fits perfectly. Uh, <clears throat> so the red flags go up everywhere when you start reading this. Uh, if you come at it from a dogmatic point of view, right? The teachings that there is only one way to heaven and it is through the risen uh, Jesus Christ. Not that, uh, not, it's not what the grand pontiff drama here is teaching Philetus. The philosopher is being instructed by a Greek God, uh, who is, he probably represents Gnosticism, by the way. Um, not to get too far into that. (laughs) He's probably representing Gnosis or, uh, at least, pre-Christianity Gnosticism, which is called Hermeticism. Um, If you want to go on the feature topic link, there's tons of Gnostic episodes on there. We get into Gnosticism a lot. But he's instructed by this Greek god who probably represents Gnosticism, and he teaches him not to be afraid of the great deity, but uh, goodness and truth is the way to heaven. And the Hindu teaches him that good works are the way to heaven, and John the Evangelist teaches him that, uh, I can't remember how I did his voice, that uh, the religions and the creeds do not matter, and the gods of the Jews, Christians, and Islam are one, all infinite continuum again this sounds real good to us nowadays uh but the like like the coexist bumper sticker crowd this sounds real good to the coexist bumper sticker crowd but to the devout religious this is heretical uh this is heretical to christians this uh this is all the first corinthian stuff this this is all the first corinthian stuff was preaching about uh, this is heretical to the Jews, and this is violently, I would hazard to guess, violently heretical to Muslims. Um, but <clears throat> we are not done. The drama unfolds further with a vision, and then everyone wakes up, and they grant the title of Grand Pontiff to to Philetus here. And just to circle back and put a pen in it, uh, the Grand Pontiff says... Melchizedek, the son of Salem, the priest of the Most High God, met Abram in the valley of Sheva. So what they're talking about, <laughs> what he's talking about, I call it World War Zero. It's World War Zero. It's after um, it's after God tried to kill the whole uni- the whole world. And when he came back, because after the flood, he disappeared for a few generations. And then when God came back and he saw Nimrod building this Tower of Babel, he freaked out. And there's actually a Bible passage. It's like, I don't know, Genesis, maybe nine, seven, eight, nine, something in there where he's like, he's look, God is looking at the Tower of Babel. And he was like, oh, my God, if all these humans can work together like this, they could do anything in the first order of business is I got to stop that shit. <laughs> <laughs> he fucking crushes it. So um, after that happens, there's this World War Zero. After God divides humanity against itself, after the Babel incident, um, these there's a war on ta- there's a war that starts about taxes. There's a giant world war started after the t- right after the Tower of Babel about about taxes and then when the war is won they introduce this character very briefly he's a very obscure character called Melchizedek war on taxes come on it's the American sermon which is the King Dale. And he was returning from the slaying of the Kings and the recovery of his brother. I don't know, brother, nephew, cousin. (laughs) If you get into the episodes, you'll see there's a, there's a joke there. 
And he gave him bread and zinc and blessed Abram. And he said, blessed be Abram, <clears throat> the most of the most high God professor or sorry, possessor of heaven and earth. And he offered him tithes of all. So do I, my brother in like manners, give you my blessing and raise my hand as did Melchizedek. And I crave from heaven, the tithe of God and goodness upon you. When I point and sanctify you be thou a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, virtuous, sincere, equitable, true, and temperate, uh, a minister of justice and priest of toleration. Be faithful to God, thy country, thy duty, thy <clears throat> and thyselves, and thus deserve the term of sublime pontiff or the Scottish mason, which you are hereafter entitled to wear. told you this is going to be a long episode. So in this right, this drama or this degree of Freemasonry, Philetus here becomes a grand pontiff associated with the king priest Melchizedek. So he is now merging the sons of fire and the sons of water or the sons of light and the sons of dark or the sons of Cain and the sons of Seth, the kingly and the priestly. So there is a lot of lessons here in this degree. I only covered the parts that I let overtly showed my point, but there's an awful lot of other stuff. Um, some of the lessons are wise and they talk of the Mason's duty to metaphorically plant trees. So future generations of people have wood to build with is about how the dead rule in only the living obey because they are basically stuck with the preparation that past generations made for them. And it is about uh, patience and doing the job correctly. And the thing ends basically with them saying, be patient, my brother, and wait. So to wrap this up, I want to go back to morals and dogma. And the, it's the very next degree in the book. <clears throat> and I guess in the lodge, right? It's a degree. It's the 20th degree. After the grand pontiff, the 20th degree is called the grand master of all symbol symbolic lodges. And Pike is preaching here about the various legends and religious emblems that Freemasons uh, use. And we'll just jump down to the middle of the chapter here. Hold on. We teach the truth of none of the legends we recite. I guess I could just stop there, but I'll go. Um, they are to us but parables and allegories involving and enveloping Masonic instruction in vehicles of the useful and in interesting information. Again, I guess I could just stop here, but I'm going to keep going. They represent the different phases of the human mind and its efforts and struggles to comprehend nature, God, and the government of the universe. The permitted existence of sorrow and evil to teach us wisdom and the folly of endeavoring to explain ourselves that which we are not capable of understanding we will produce the speculations of the philosophers, the Kabbalists, the mystagogues, and the Gnostics, everyone being at liberty to apply our symbols and emblems as he thinks most consistent with the truth and reason of his own faith. We give them such an interpretation only as may be accepted by all. Our degrees may be conferred in France or Turkey or Peking or Esfanan, Rome, Geneva, in the city of Penn, or in Catholic Louisiana. <laughs> upon the subject of an absolute government or the citizens of a free state, upon the secretarian or theist, the honor of the deity to regard all men as our brethren, as our children, equally uh, dear to him of the supreme creator of the universe and to make himself useful in the society and himself by his labor are teaching us uh 
teaching to its initiates in all degrees. The preacher of liberty, fraternity, and equality is de- desires them to be attained by making men fit to receive them. And by their moral power of an intelligent, enlightened people, it lays no plots, conspiracies, it hatches no premature revolutions, it encourages no people to revolt against the cons- constituted authorities. But recognizing the great truth that freedom follows fitness. (laughs) Okay, I'm going to back up. But recognizing the great truth that freedom follows fitness for freedom as a colliery follows the axiom. It strives to prepare men to govern themselves. I think that's a great place to stop. Um, the overall theme of the episode and the overall theme of the show is right there. Preparing men to govern themselves. All right. I am John Towers, and this has been the American Sermon. Please remember to check out uh, my regular podcast, the Abercast, especially if you like these sort of topics. It's a podcast about the occult, history, conspiracy, and violence. Also, check out Abercast.com. There's social media links there at the bottom. I would love to hear what you guys think about the work I'm doing here, uh, for sure. There's the the feature topic link, which I talked about probably too much uh, during the episode. It's all categorized, and if you're looking for topics like this... um, like I said, we're currently working on a tarot card series, which ties into this. We're currently working on a Kabbalah series, which we're, are tied into this. Um, there's a whole masonry section you can find. There's stuff on Mikelzedek you can find there. Uh, World War Zero is on there. And also there's a whole section on masonry. You might like if you um, are, li- or if you're interested in this, there's a whole masonry section there. Um, yeah. And ultimately... Uh, you'll want to check out the next two, at least two, if you're interested in this Mason stuff, at least the next two episodes of um, the American Sermon. So I'm John Towers. This is, Thank you very much. Uh, this is the the last episode zero. Like, it's actually starting. We're actually starting. You know, like when you're going up a roller coaster and you're like, chicka, 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 up to the top of the hill, chicka, 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 up to the very top of the hill, chicka, 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 and you can feel like the car starts to like level out just a tiny bit and you know this giant hill is next this right now right this very moment is where we are on this trip we're taking together called the american sermon john towers thank you very much stigmatastudios.com theabercast.com check out my books buy a t-shirt whatever you want Thank you guys so much. Thank you so much for all this early support. I appreciate it.